God brings the spiritually dead to life. He himself died and then rose again. And then the ministry of the gospel allows us to share in that resurrection. The, though we are dead in sin, we may be made alive in Christ. Every individual salvation, every person who becomes a Christian is a spiritual resurrection taking place, authored by God. This resurrection business is eternal in its scope. It eclipses the other things in our lives, and it forms the solid basis for an identity that we are children of God, that we were dead in our sin, but we're made alive in Christ Jesus. We're in Ephesians chapter 2 today. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. This is on page 976 in the Bibles in the seats with you. This text describes, I believe, what will take place in hearts today. I believe it is a narrative of what God has done, what he will do, what he simply does, and what he is doing in this room as we read it. And you know who you are. You know who you are. Maybe far from God. Far from God. You didn't come here because you wanted to. You came here because grandma won't let you have any lunch unless you come to church with her. You came here because you have a, a crush on one of my church members. I don't blame you. They're beautiful people. You're far from God. I want you to listen closely because this text could tell the very story of what is happening in your heart as we read it. You know these words are true in a way you've always known. But because of sin, you may have suppressed that truth. Pack that down deep so that you can have license to do whatever you want, whatever your flesh desires to do. But in your heart of hearts, it's something that's always been there that you've always known. You've always known that the gospel is true. You've always known that Jesus is Lord. You've always known that sin has consequences. You've always known. You've always known the truth. And today, today, that truth latent within you causes your dead heart to beat for the first time. Can I read, as you find Ephesians 2, can I, can I read a story from the Gospels? Can I talk about Jesus while we study an epistle? Is that okay? <laughs> Is there a sign forbidding that? Here's Luke chapter 7, verse 11. Soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow meaning she's destitute. She has nobody to provide for her in that culture. And a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, rise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and the surrounding country. The text doesn't say what this man said upon being resurrected, but I guarantee there was no braggadocio in his words. He didn't stand up in his casket and beat his chest and flex. You understand? He can take no credit for his own resurrection. Whom did they glorify after this miracle took place? They glorified Jesus. They looked at his resurrection and gave God glory. Isn't that a Christian testimony? That people would look at you and see your resurrection, the transformation in your life, and give your God glory. This is a story of resurrection. Jesus ruining a perfectly good funeral. <laughs> I wonder if the widow was a little bit mad. The mother of the man was a little bit mad because like she'd paid all these fees, people brought these flowers, they had all these nice gifts. Like what did she do with the gifts afterward? <laughs> so can I take my gift back? No, Carl, you gave it to me. <laughs> Jesus ruined more than one funeral in his ministry, did you know that? Walking up and making the dead alive. 
What is it like from the perspective of the dead man? Hey, hey, everybody. What? What was it like from the perspective of the resurrected? Why is this miracle in the Bible? What does it teach us about the character of Jesus? I believe it's a picture of every Christian testimony. Jesus walking up to the casket and saying, I say to you, rise. 14 people gave their lives to Jesus Christ at Highlands Community Church last weekend. <laughs> Praise God. Which means that he went to 14 different seats and said, I say to you, arise. I command you to live. Wake up, sleeper. You rise from the dead. Christ is shining on you. Get up and walk. You were dead, but now you're alive again. 14 different seats in the combined spaces of worship for Highland Community Church. Watch out. You might be sitting in one of them. This is a picture of what Jesus did. It's what he does. I believe it's what he is doing Let's look together at Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Isn't that an amazing text? Shall we go back? verse by verse through it and savor it? Let's do it. Look, look to the ever so offensive first verse. Look at, look at verse one. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. All right, he's gonna reiterate this truth in verse five, that we're dead in our trespasses, dead in our sins. My, my skeptical friend, my skeptical friend who has a, has a crush on a member of Highlands Community Church, uh, like, if, if I may, look at this through your eyes. You're like, Pastor Jesse, I'm already offended. Like, I'm already, I've already written off everything else in this sermon because of the words of the very first verse. Like, I already think that it's inaccurate. I already find it disproven. And for that reason, I'm going to catch up on email through your sermon because the very first words I know are untrue. Like, I'm not a Christian, but I know I'm not dead. I mean, I'm sitting in the room. I'm breathing. I know for a fact I'm not actually dead. But granted, you probably also would concede that this is not about physical death. This is a spiritual death. Yeah, Jesse, that's even more offensive. Like, I'm so bad. I'm so innately evil that I'm, I'm as good as dead. That's pretty severe. T tone it down a notch there, fire and brimstone. All right, that's really judgmental of you. All right, here's the thing. You're in good company. If you have committed sin in your life, would you raise your hand? <laughs> this is a sketchy crowd. <laughs> you see that? Does your family know where you are? <laughs> All right, text mom and tell her where you're at. Look, man, it's okay. We as Christians do like, we, we have all sinned, okay? We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us has sinned. There's not a person in this room, there's not a Christian in this room who's gonna look at you condescendingly because you've got sin because we've all sinned too. We have all sinned. The word is we in Romans 3.23. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All is what the text says. So there's not a single Christian in this room who could look at you condescendingly because we know what it's like to be dead in sin. My skeptical friend, can you also be brutally honest with me for just a second here? You're not really alive. You haven't been able to find life in anything. 
I know you haven't found life in anything because there's life in nothing but Christ. Look, look at me and just be honest, okay? I know, I know you have found no life in your drugs. I know there's nothing but death there for you. You and I both know that your addictions have not brought you life. We both know that the riches of this world, the more of them you accumulate, the emptier you feel. We both know, we both know that material gain has just left you empty inside. And we both know that even the pursuit of riches, it's not brought you life. Be honest with yourself. It's not brought you life. It's just added commas and zeros onto your bereavement. You are dead in sin, my friend. And you've been trying to fill that vacuum in your heart with relationships and like a revolving door, people come in and out of your life and none of them is able to fulfill you. I know you haven't found life because there's life in nobody but Jesus. Don't knock it till you've tried it. <laughs> Give your life to Jesus today and come alive in Christ. I know that it can be an offensive notion, the idea that you would be dead in sin. And you disagree with the very first verse, but you and I both know you've not found life anywhere else. And also, may I please, please point out, we don't get to tell God how offensive our sin is. Jesse, dead? I'm dead? Excuse me. I've read headline stories of Christian pastors, okay, who cheat on their wives and embezzle money from the church and do terrible things. Okay, I'm not as bad as those guys. I may use the HOV lane every now and then to get around a traffic jam. But that's not that bad, okay? Don't call 206-724-HERO on me. <laughs> Isn't it funny that we use the word hero? Like, that's a bit of a stretch of the word hero. <laughs> Does anybody really believe that about yourself? I'm a hero. No, you didn't see the baby seat in the back seat. Also, there's this thing called due process. I may use the HOV lane to skip around a traffic jam every now and then, Jesse, but I'm not as bad as some Christians. Thank you very much. I will excuse myself from verse one's accusation that I'm actually spiritually dead. But my friend, you don't get to tell God how offensive your sin is. When you hit someone's car in the parking lot, you don't tell them what the damages are. It is against God that you and I have sinned. He is the one who's been offended. He is the one who determines the cost. He is quite capable of speaking for himself. In fact, he spoke and the universe came into existence out of nothingness. He has spoken in his word and he's very clear. Romans 6, 23, he tells us what the cost of our sin is. Regardless of how, regardless of how egregious you perceive it to be, Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death. Indeed, regardless of how egregious you perceive your sins to be, the wages for our sin is death. You are, my skeptical friend, dead in sin. Now, again, please don't be too offended by that. It's not your fault you're dead. <laughs> and, and nobody at Highlands is going to tell you, hey, stop being dead, right? It's not, it's not how it works, because we were dead, but God breathed life into us. And now we're inviting you into that same grace in which we abide. We are all, by nature, sinful, and we're dead in our trespasses. Then look at verse two. These are the sins in which you once walked. Isn't the past tense beautiful there, Christian? You think about your own past sins in which you once walked. You used to walk in these ways. Now compare verse 2 to verse 10, the second verse of our text to the last verse of our text, that you used to walk in your sins, but now skip ahead to the ending of the text. Now you walk in the good works that God has prepared in advance for you. You used to walk in sin, now you walk in good works. There's a testimony in between, isn't there? You once walked in these ways, following the course of this world. What is the course of this world? Watch the news for five minutes and plot a trajectory for society based on what you see. That's the course of this world. That's where society is headed. Following the prince of the power of the air. Ah, man, I knew when I came to church there'd be some 
weird, like, hocus-pocus stuff, and here it is. <laughs> Following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. This word prince refers to either an angel or a demon throughout the Bible, depending on its usage. For example, in Daniel chapter 10, Daniel, remember Daniel in the lion's den, okay, this prophet Daniel, an angel is speaking to him. And in Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, that angel says, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. See that? So the prince of the kingdom of Persia, that refers to a demon. Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. So prince of Persia is a demon. Chief prince Michael is an angel. So the word prince refers to a demon and an angel in the first verse of this selection alone. For I was left there with the kings of Persia and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision is for days to come. And then after strengthening Daniel... He says to him in verse 10, then he said, do you know why I have come to you? But now I'll return to fight against the prince of Persia. When I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. So you can see these provinces held sway over by given demons, a prince of Greece, prince of Persia. And this is, this is known as sort of like the territorial nature of demons. It has a biblical basis in the, according to Daniel and then we see, according to Ephesians, that is the same spirit that is now at work. It can be a creepy thought that like demons in a, in a form of, uh, a, of principality, meaning a monarchical feudal region, would hold sway over a given space. But if you've gone to the DMV, you already know that's true. <laughs> There's the prince of the Department of Licensing. <laughs> Right? There's a prince of this one section of 405. <laughs> and and when, when, when you turn on the news, you see news of mass shootings, hatred rampant, racism, despicable evil taking place. You can see demonic power at work. I don't, I don't need to convince you that wrong, horrible, evil things happen in our culture, in our world, in our society. I, I believe that's proof of this text. But, Romans 12, 21, do not be overcome by evil, Christian. Rather, overcome evil with good. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. The one whom you serve, Christian, is the victor, is the conqueror who reigns forevermore. And though, according to the book of Job in the beginning, the enemy may win from time to time, he may be given freedoms to attack from time to time, even these things, Genesis 50, which the enemy would intend for evil, God can use for good. And even these things, Romans 8, 28, may be worked together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And if I may spoil the ending, go to the end of the book, God wins. So let these princes have their jurisdictions for now. Their doom is spelled for them as God wins in the end and brings every force of evil to absolute reckoning. Jesus wins. Place your heart and your hope in that, Christian. Now, my friend who's far from God, my friend who's far from God, I must invite you into the grace and the protection of the gospel of Jesus Christ that you would not be so attacked as this. Chapter six of this book, Ephesians chapter six, verse 12, describes this. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We're gonna arrive in chapter six and delve into this further. But you don't need to look at culture along to agree that evil is real and it's at work in this world. You can see these glimpses of how creation was once so perfect. You can see these glimpses. Sometimes the sunset hues will strike the snows at the peak of Rainier in the distance as you drive, distracting you. <laughs> and you can just say, oh, it's so beautiful. You get these glimpses of the beauty of creation. You can see, oh, man, it used to be perfect. It used to be, you get these glimpses of Eden every now and then, don't you? Oh, man, it's exquisite. It's so beautiful. You know, and then you get a call from your in-laws. You know, oh, we're not in Eden anymore. 
I mean, you, you, you see these glimpses of the beauty and the perfection uh, as God created it to begin with. But then you can also see, oh man, evil's at work. Everything was perfect, but then sin entered the picture, and now it's been fractured. But God didn't leave us that way. Right there in the Garden of Eden, he prophesied that he would make a way. You see, the Old Testament law is this perfect pedestal, this perfect foundation, this basis for New Testament salvation. You see these glimpses of the perfection of Eden, and you can see the effects of evil as it attacks. But in the end, you can, you can know, you can know that God has a plan for redemption, and it's exquisite. Look at, look at this text with me. Verse 3, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Passions of our flesh, desires of our body and of our mind, this actually sounds like what our modern day culture would tell you is actually the basis for your identity and your truth. We live in a cultural narrative that would tell you, hey, listen, whatever lust your body desires after is a good thing, is your route toward happiness. In fact, it classifies you as a type of person, as though lustful proclivities classify us in the way that ethnicities do. It spells out this fatalistic destiny that you're just doomed to walk in obedience toward as though there's no way you're ever gonna be able to resist the, the, the passions of your flesh, the desires of your body, the desires of your mind. And they even tell you what's true for you. They say, this is your particular brand of truth. And what's true for you is true for you. And what's true for other people is true for other people depending on what their flesh desires, what they lust after, what their minds and bodies desire. That is the pervading ethos of our culture, that whatever you lust after, whatever you passionately desire with your flesh determines your identity and it tells you, tells you your truth. My friend, these are our basest proclivities, and these are the worst imaginable foundations for identity. There is nothing worse you could possibly define yourself by than your most carnal desires. Just because you desire something passionately in your flesh doesn't make it a good thing. It doesn't make it true. It doesn't make it the basis of your identity. In fact, these base desires, these carnal urges, these lusts of our flesh, passions of our flesh, desires of our flesh, desires of our bodies, desires of our minds, they actually make us children of wrath according to this text. This is one of the fundamental differences of Christianity to different religions. Like, we know that we were born with a sin nature. You cannot trust the desires of your flesh, the passions of your flesh, the desires of your mind. You may think that you're looking at things with objectivity, with neutrality, but because of the doctrine of total depravity, we know that we're not looking at things objectively. The lens through which you view truth and morality in the world itself is stained by your own sinful proclivities, by our own depraved desires. Left to our own devices, we will seek after lust and then seek after more, and we will cost everyone around us anything it takes to get what we crave. The passions of our flesh, the desires of our bodies are actually a compass that would lead us straight to destruction. This has happened over and over again repeatedly across the millennia within human history. It's nothing new. You're not enlightened because you define yourself by your basest desires. That is not a moral compass. Rather, this is. I pray that you would find a new identity in Christ and then watch your desires change. How many of you have experienced this? Before Christ, you wanted certain things, and then once you gave your life to Christ, your desires just changed. How many of you can relate to that? Doesn't Christ change the things that we want? You begin to want the things that God wants. And so the things you pray for change. Somebody who's not saved is praying the wrong prayers. They're praying for the desires of their flesh, the desires of their minds. And God's not gonna answer those prayers. Why? Because they don't desire the will of God. This is why Christians tend to have their prayers answered, whereas non-Christians don't, because the Christian's been transformed by the Holy Spirit. You desire the things of God. And so when you desire the things of God, you pray for the will of God, God tends to obey. God tends to fulfill prayers that are prayed in accordance with his will. This is nothing new. This is nothing, this is nothing new. It, it, it's, the truth is, my skeptical friend, you would claim neutrality, but again, you're looking at the truth through a distorted lens. And Christian, people of this world who would engage the gospel with hostility would claim to be neutral, but they aren't. Neither should you be. You actually have a moral framework. You have an authoritative source of truth. Jesse, isn't that, a, isn't that circular reasoning? 
to, use, to believe that the Bible's true because the Bible says that it's true? No, do you remember this big term we defined a few weeks ago, revelational epistemology? We find ourselves having been born into the same universe whose origins are inexplicable by its own naturalistic means. It must have been created from without. And here we are, and in the mirror of our bones, we know that there is a pervasive sense of morality. We know that murder is wrong. We all have these rulers in our hearts by which, these consciences by which we know certain things are good and certain things are evil. How do we know which worldview is true? Well, God has revealed himself, revelational epistemology. Rather, it is the secularist who would say, I know that my logical view is true. I know that my reasoning is true. Well, how do you know? By what standard do you know that your reasoning is true, my secular friend? By what standard do you know your reasoning is true? Well, if you're honest, it's by your reasoning. I know that my reasoning is true because I've measured it by my own reasoning. By my reasoning, my reasoning is true, and I reason that my reason is true. Do you see what's happening? Rather, I appeal to the true authority, the word of God. God has revealed himself to us, and I can see, like the rest of mankind, that left our own devices, our passions of our flesh, the desires of our body, we will just sink further and further into depravity apart from an intervention by the Holy Spirit of God who transforms us and brings the dead to life. Do you see the words like the rest of mankind in verse 3, Christian? Do you notice this? We as the church are the ecclesia. According to Strong's Concordance 1577, this means probably the people who are called out from the world and called to God. We're called out from the world and called to God. Consider Jesus' prayer for his disciples. In John 17, awaiting the cross before, while he's in Gethsemane, he prays for his disciples and then he prays for everybody who would believe because of the disciples' message. Here's part of his prayer for his disciples. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. This is Jesus' prayer, not that we be taken out of the world, but that we be protected, by, protected from the evil one. We are called to the glory of God to be a little bit weird. Look at verse four. But God, being rich in mercy. This is years ago. This is, I asked our worship team to include this song in the lineup, the song that we sang in the worship set by Big Daddy Weave. I seriously doubt they remember me. But back in the day, I actually drummed for them. I drummed for that band back when they were called Big Daddy Weave and the Institution. I like that name better. They wrote this perfect song because it was drawn from the very text that we're reading today. But God. Have you ever been to a, a, a church when, when testimonies are being shared? This is, this is like a church kid. This is like a church kid, you know, legend, right? It's the testimony sharing time. I just imagine you've been asked to share your testimony, to tell your story, right? And, and you, you, you're second to get up and share. And somebody gets up before you and they tell their story, they tell their testimony, gets up and tells the crowd, everybody, I used to be a cannibal and a crackhead. And then I was a crackhead cannibal. But now, I shared the gospel, and I have started orphanages in 130 countries. And everybody's like, whoa, that's amazing. And everybody gets up and stands up and claps and cheers for the reformed crackhead cannibal, now founder of orphanages across the world. And then it's your turn <laughs> to share your testimony. And your testimony goes something like, I was saved when, I'm, when I was six, I'm still saved. And so because the, the crackhead cannibal got up, or excuse me, you can't call him that anymore, the orphanage owner got up before you, you feel the need to embellish your testimony and make like the, the before part of your testimony really, really, really depraved. And so you talk about what a terrible six-year-old you, six you used to be. I was so lost. I used to stay up way past eight. 
but God saved me. And now I go to bed right on time. You, you, don't need to, you, you don't need to brag about how sinful you used to be for your testimony to be dramatic, Christian, okay? You don't need to emphasize it. The power of a testimony, the power of the story of what God did in your life is not dictated by the drama of the narrative. The power of the testimony is in the spirit who transforms. Do you understand? And the same Holy Spirit of God who transforms Saul of Tarsus into the apostle who is inspired to write much of the New Testament is the same Holy Spirit who changes you. If you're looking for a way to encapsulate your story, Christian, your testimony, this is it. Verse 1, I was dead in sin. Verse 4, but God, being rich in mercy. This is the crux of your testimony. But God, I was dead in sin, but God brought me to life. Tell your story, Christian, because it's irrefutable proof. It doesn't matter how many monkey skulls we dig up in the desert. Like, you know what God's done in your life. No, but who's going to correct you on your story? Who's going to come? No, but Gary, that's not your story. Like, nobody knows your story better than you. Christian, this is your story. This is your testimony. So tell the story of what happened in your life. Verse 1, you were dead in sin. Verse 4, but God. You tell that story. Share the news. It's beautiful, beautiful news. The whole gospel is predicated upon the love of God. You see that in verse 4? being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Have you ever seen a church that beats only the drum of the grace and the mercy, the grace, the mercy, the grace, the mercy, no, no word ever of repentance from sin. We don't talk about sin. We don't talk about hell. That's impolite, right? Just the mercy, just the grace, just the mercy. You're like, it's true, but there's more. And then if you go into another church, where it's just wrath for sin and wrath for sin and wrath for sin, God's wrath for sin. You're like, it's true, but there's more. Like, don't you wish you could introduce these two to each other? See these two churches merge with one another? And instead you would see the full gospel truth that yes, we were dead in our sin, which made us children of wrath, but God, rich in mercy and love for us. Christian, as you share the gospel, you gotta beat both drums, you understand? Tell the news of our depravity and our sin, but tell the news of the glorious riches of the immeasurable grace of God. Don't downplay the mercy and emphasize only the wrath. Don't exclusively tell about the wrath and neglect to tell them about the grace and the mercy and the love because both are necessary for a complete gospel presentation. We were dead in our sins, but God, rich in mercy and grace and love. That is a Bible-wide gospel presentation. Look at verse 5. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved. Here's Romans 5, verse 6 through 8. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though for perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You can tell much about somebody based on how they treat somebody who could never repay them. Like, it reveals much about somebody's character, what they do for somebody who could never pay them back for the good that they've done. Consider, by that standard, what the gospel teaches us about the nature of God. Because who in this room could possibly repay God for what he's done for us? The gospel there's nobody here could ever pay God back. It is simply because of his love. The whole of the gospel is predicated upon the love of God. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever would believe in him would not die but have everlasting life. But God, because he's rich in mercy because of his immeasurable love he poured out upon us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places. This is awesome. God raises the Christian up. The Christian doesn't elevate his or herself up. You understand? God raises the Christian up. We don't raise ourselves up. Look at verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. Man, 
this is just not the book you want to study if you're a legalist. Like, this is not the church you want to go to if you're a Pharisee, okay? Because this book of Ephesians is going to punch you right in the pride. I mean, it's brutal. No one can boast. This is not your own doing. It's not a result of works. You can't increase your own standing before God one iota with your righteous works. Nobody can boast in our righteousness. It is a gift of God. It is a gift of God. He gives us. My, my syncretist friend. Syncretism is the practice of treating worldviews like they are a buffet. I'll have a little bit of this. This is convenient for me. I like this prosperity teaching. Yeah, I'll have some financial freedom. I'll take karma as long as I can use it well, right? Like we, we'll go through the buffet and take what we want from the buffet of worldviews. Let me, let me, this is not so much a, a case for the veracity or truthfulness of Christianity. Rather, I want to make a case for the distinctiveness of Christianity just for a moment for my syncretist friends, my universalist friends who are here in the room with us. You'll find that when you put Christianity on your plate, it kicks all the other things off, okay? Other religious worldviews would assume to be mountain guides showing you the way up Rainier. And they would all claim to be congruous with one another. They all just have different base camps, but they all arrive at the same summit. Doesn't that sound so ecumenical? Doesn't that sound so nice? But then comes Christianity. Right? The idea of many religious worldviews is to equip you with the tools that you need to elevate yourself to ascend the mountain of righteousness yourself unto salvation, unto nirvana, unto some sort of elevated status. Here are the tools that you need to save yourself. Christianity, radically different from every other worldview. According to this text, you're dead, okay? Here you go, dead guy, here are your climbing ropes. Whoa. You're there at the base of the mountain, dead. You cannot climb, you understand? But God, rich in mercy because of his immeasurable love, even while you're dead in your trespasses, would make you alive and he would bring you into salvation. This is why, my syncretist friend, you can't have Christianity and, because it is radically incongruous, completely incompatible with all the other worldviews here at the buffet. You understand? Christianity is radically different. God pursuing us. There's no other worldview like this. There's no other worldview like this. Man, this is, this is brutal, right? Nobody can boast. It's, it's not our doing. It's a gift of God. We can't really boast in our own righteousness. Since we can't boast in our own righteousness, is it okay with everybody in the room if I boast in how righteous Jesus is for a moment? Let's boast in Jesus. Jesus, you are righteous. You are perfect. You are the Holy One. You came down into the world that you created. You lived among us. You lived a perfect life. You were tempted in every way that we are, yet you were without sin. You touched the lepers. You made the blind see. You brought the dead back to life. And then you took upon yourself the payment for our sins. And you rose again. And you are victorious. You ascended on high. You sit at the right hand of the Father. You will return to reign forever. You will destroy death. You will destroy hell. You will destroy evil itself, God. You are the victor. You reign. You are amazing. You are perfect. You are the righteous one, Jesus. It's a beautiful, beautiful thought. If you can't boast in your own righteousness, just boast in how great your Jesus is. He, for the Christian, has destroyed hell. Hell itself still exists, but for, for the Christian, Jesus has made us righteous. This is verse 10. We are his workmanship. We are his workmanship. Like the book of Philippians says, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. To the day that you physically die, Christian, there's an under construction sign on your heart. The process of sanctification will never be done until you are forever glorified with him in heaven one day. But until that day, we continue when we Sin, we repent, we follow the Spirit's leading. Because we're alive, we're uncomfortable in graves. People who are alive tend to have an aversion to being in caskets. Why? Because they're alive. <laughs> so when you find yourself tempted to get back in sin, you repent, you repent. The Holy Spirit's indwelling in your life has made you forever, forever uncomfortable in the graveyard. Right? It has ruined the fun of sin for you, Christian. So you repent. You repent forevermore. Now, these good works, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, do these good works save you, Christian? No. 
Rather, we do these good works because we've been saved. And be prepared for this. Be prepared for this. Remember what we learned in the pastoral epistles as Paul told Timothy, be ready in season and out of season. And quite often, out of season (laughs) is when you don't feel like it. Remember, God is sovereign over time. He has prepared good works for you to, uh, to walk in obedience to this coming week. And just be warned, the enemy doesn't want you to walk in obedience to those. So it's often going to be the things that you feel like doing the least, which are the best of the good works that God has prepared for you to do. So be ready, in season and out of season. Walk in obedience to these good works. Look at what a transformation takes place in 10 verses. Dead in sin, walking in good works that God has prepared for you. That's a testimony. That's a story. And I believe it's a story that's being written. How many caskets has Jesus touched in this room right now? You came in here, my skeptical friend, you were far from God. And then you see your reflection in the story. You see your reflection in the text. You know, yes, I I have been dead in my sin. I haven't been able to find life anywhere else but God. Rich in mercy and love like you've never known until this day. While you're dead in your trespasses has made you alive, how many heartbeats have begun here in this room today? If that's you, I want to invite you to pray God's word to God, to pray John 3, 16, Romans 3, 23, Romans 6, 23, John 14, 6, and Romans 10, 9, with me out to God. Would you join me in prayer? God, I believe that you love the world so much that you gave your one and only son that if I would believe in him, I would not die but have everlasting life. I confess that I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I confess, God, that the wages of my sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Jesus, I believe that you are the way. I believe that you, Jesus, are the life. I believe that you, Jesus, are the truth. And I believe there's no way I can come to the Father except through Jesus. And so filled with the Holy Spirit of God, I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Highlands Community Church, would you say Jesus is Lord? Say it, Jesus is Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. Now God, save me, save me, God, save me, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand and worship with us? Some of us for the very first time as brand new believers in Jesus.